Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Some weeks ago, I was joined by Jared Trueheart for a conversation. Jared Trueheart is, of course, a frequent guest on my supposed live streaming channel. In this conversation, we were determined to do all due diligence. Back in 2021, we recorded a podcast entitled Critic YouTube and the Manosphere are Embarrassments. And later, I was inspired and made a video essay entitled It's Time to Move On. Open brackets. Fans of Critic YouTube are not seeking good entertainment. Close brackets. In the podcast and the video, the argument made was everyone needed to stop consuming mainstream pop culture. Sequels, prequels, spin-offs, soft reboots, etc. As they were becoming increasingly terrible, propagandistic, and even immoral. However, in neither the podcast nor the video was any advice given on how to move on. Only that people should move on. Realising that such an omission could not stand in this discussion, Jared and I decided that we should have a crack at it, and give advice for people who either want to move on from pop culture, or who are thinking about moving on. And it was a great conversation. Unfortunately, we suffered a massive technical failure. I tested my recording software before we began our podcast, and it successfully recorded both our exchanges, but the second time I used the software, it only captured Jared's speech. So rather than upload half a conversation for my supposed live streaming channel, I have decided to turn our thoughts and ideas into a proper video essay. Now that I've provided an explanation and introduction with the necessary pomp, let us dive into the beginning. There are two groups of people who need to move on from pop culture and the mainstream creative media industries. Although I hesitate to use the adjective creative to describe said mega corporations. The first group are consumers, and the second are YouTube critics. Both groups have different obstacles which stop them from moving on. The consumers are obstructed by three stumbling blocks fandom, nostalgia, and shared cultural experiences. I shall outline what I mean by all three in turn. By fandom, I mean identity. Building an identity around a brand, franchise, or set of media, and having those define your lifestyle and sense of self. For the person who has built his sense of self around a media franchise, but who wants to move on, fandom is not best described as a mere problem, but instead as a titan. This person may recognise, for instance, that new Star Trek media are terminally bad, awful, and disrespectful, to everything which came before. But if said person's identity is that of a Trekkie, then he is going to feel compelled to buy the merchandise, the Funko Pops, watch the new series, complain about the new series, and pray that things will get better. Or else delude himself that the new media are good. And he'll do all this because his identity is constructed around fandom, around being a Star Trek fan, a Trekkie. And if he were to move on, there would be a void in his sense of self. By nostalgia, I mean memories of better things which make it hard to move on. While fandom is all about the present, i.e. the identity you have built around a franchise, nostalgia is about the past and your old feelings about said franchise. A person afflicted with nostalgia for a certain franchise will continue with Star Trek as our example may recognise that the new series are abominable, and that the creators don't care for what came before, but because the iconography and aesthetics of the universe awaken warm feelings of previous experiences with the old media, he'll look past how bad it has become and view it, even if he is watching a skin suit of what he once loved. This person too may be guilty of deluding himself that the new media are good. And finally, Shared cultural experiences. I discussed this at the very end of my video, It's Time to Move On, open brackets, fans of Critic YouTube are not seeking good entertainment, close brackets, and in an article I wrote for the Praxiarchy website, spotlighting art for the moth-like masses. This obstacle I think is the biggest one for people who are often called normies online. I may as well play the after credits clip from It's Time to Move On to explain the problem. 
I think there is another problem which discourages some fans from moving on. Some people are willing to watch bad media because they want to have a shared cultural experience with friends, fans, and other people in society. For instance, all my friends and I, one way or another, watched the Star Wars sequels. We didn't like the films, but after watching them, we had a shared cultural experience among not only ourselves, but also among the rest of the general populace in Great Britain and the wider Western world who had also seen the film. My friends and I enjoyed discussing how bad The Last Jedi was in particular, and arguing with people who thought it was good. The Star Wars sequels might have been bad, but we got something out of them. On the other hand, I have read some ebooks by independent authors which were better than the Star Wars sequels, but I cannot talk about them with anyone because they are quite obscure. The ebooks I have read were not, and probably will never be, widely read by people in society, and thus will never form the basis of a shared cultural experience. The second course of action I have outlined in the main section of this video essay does have a unique challenge. If individuals are going to take this course of action earnestly, ways and means of promoting good original media will have to be discovered, adopted, and perfected so a larger shared experience can be created in order to make fun and interesting discussions about said media a possibility. For some individuals, this is a tough sell, because part of the reason they engage with certain media is for the social function that comes along with it, the easily shared cultural and social experience which allows them to become part of something larger. Thus, this is another roadblock which must be overcome to move on. Basically, some people may want to opt out of watching derivative sequels, garbage soft reboots, and insulting, propagandistic adaptions, but find it hard because when they do unplug, they realise that they cannot talk or relate to their friends and relatives who do watch the latest rubbish. A lot of people engage with media which A. they think they'll enjoy, and B. which they think everyone else is going to engage with as well. For the person who doesn't wish to be perceived as a weirdo or killjoy, or who simply wants to be able to talk with his friends and relatives about stuff and spend time with them, moving on from current media will be a massive hurdle because he will lose out on shared cultural experiences. These are the problems which the consumers face. What is the method to surpassing these three obstacles? How do you break through these walls? I admitted in the conversation that I had spent much time dwelling on these very hurdles and could not think of a clear way to get past any of them. But Jared suggested there was a simple way to deal with the nostalgia and shared cultural experiences issues and that was to create new shared experiences with friends and relatives via sharing and enjoying new independent media. He posited that this would help with the nostalgia issue because the new shared experiences would help individuals to stop dwelling on the past and thus help them move on from the franchises which provided them so much entertainment and happiness in the past. I agreed that this would work, but the question is, how does one do it? Well, we hashed out two steps which must be followed. Step one, you, yes, you, ladies and gentlemen, must seek independently created media, books, films, audiobooks, etc., and sort out the wheat from the chaff. In order to execute this first step successfully, you will have to adopt an adventurer's mindset. Now, what do I mean? I mean, you must perceive yourself as an intrepid explorer looking for new and exciting fiction in the wild west of creativity, and that by doing so, you are embarking on bold quests to seek treasure. Now, of course, not all expeditions will be fruitful, but no adventure is without risk, and you will have to accept danger and even meet disappointment if you want to find good entertainment outside the debauched and undead realm of mainstream pop culture. Step 2. Once you have found independent media that you enjoy, you must aggressively push them onto your friends and relatives. You need to tell people in your social circles that they must give this independent book, film, song, music, picture, etc. a try. You must be an advertiser for the independent fiction you want them to try, because no one else is going to sell it to them. This will take energy, and it is true you can only lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. Nevertheless, 
This is the only method. If steps 1 and 2 are completed successfully, then you and your friends will have enjoyed a new book, for instance, and will be able to talk about it with each other. Thus, you will create a shared cultural experience, which is separate from Mega Corporation Film Slop. Now, fortunately, these two steps are easier than ever before because of something I previously mentioned in this article, the fragmentation of audiences. In our conversation, Jared mentioned that decades before, there was a shared mainstream culture where everyone was watching the same thing. For instance, M.A.S.H. M.A.S.H. was a popular TV series in the 1970s in America, and if you watched an episode one night, you could be sure that all your friends, relatives and work colleagues had also watched it, and you could talk about it the next day, and thus it formed a shared cultural experience. But this is no longer the case. People now watch different shows at different times, and everything has become more niche, and no one is watching the same thing at the same time. Mainstream culture doesn't exist anymore, and although the film industry keeps trying to tap into the nostalgia of old mainstream culture with reboots and sequels, such as the new Indiana Jones film, their efforts have been giant failures as of late. For my money, the last mainstream shared cultural experience was Avengers Endgame. This film, and all the other films leading up to it, was watched by nearly everyone. Nearly all your friends, neighbours and relatives would have seen this final film, and I remember this time well. But after Endgame, the wider populace lost interest in Marvel films, and the Phase 4 films and TV series are only watched by die-hard Marvel fans. Because mainstream culture isn't really a thing anymore, independent creators have an opportunity to exploit the new, multifaceted consumer landscape and try to advertise their creations to newly formed niche audiences and floating consumers. This means that you may have an easier time persuading your friends and relatives to engage with independent stories, because they may already be looking beyond mainstream pop culture, since it no longer functionally exists. To be sure, this advice isn't exactly easy to follow, but it is the only solution. We both agreed that independent creators can help by making their work as professional in its presentation as possible, and as accessible as possible. For instance, independent authors should create or commission quality front covers, and musicians and bands should produce engaging music and lyric videos for their songs. The better the presentation, the easier it will be for admirers to share your work. We'd both hasten to add that the best way to share new media is to do so physically, and in the physical presence of your friends and relatives. Don't just share links to independent music. Buy the CD and place in the car when you are next on a journey with a friend or family member. Similarly, do not suggest a new independent film, but invite your friends and relatives around your place for a film night and play said film. And don't share a PDF of an independent book you have enjoyed, but instead give your friends a physical copy and read out some chapters to them. This too isn't easy advice, but it is truthful and real advice. But now I can hear audience members raising hands about the fandom problem. How do you move on from pop culture when you have built your identity around consuming the merchandise and media of a pop culture franchise. New shared cultural experiences with new independent media are surely not going to be enough. Before delving deeper into this problem, I deem it wise to give this disclaimer. There is nothing wrong with being nerdy, having nerd interests, or enjoying geeky discussions with your friends. There is also nothing intrinsically wrong with collecting Funko Pops, or doing cosplays at events such as Comic Con. What is detrimental, however, is making these things your identity, rather than enjoying them as interests and hobbies. Alright, let's dive under. In my opinion, building your sense of worth and identity around being part of a fandom is caused by deeper psychological issues, and is often the consequence of deracinization, the process whereby a person's roots are removed. Over the past century, Western societies, their governments and institutions, have de-emphasized and stigmatized identities or roots based on ethnic 
national, racial, familial, regional, and religious bases. The exceptions to this rule are grievance groups. Black people, immigrant groups, the alphabet soup flag people, and more are allowed to anchor their identities in concepts and ideas which the historic populations of Western countries are not allowed, without being called ists or phobes of one kind or another. However, this deracinization has, in one sense, afforded the individual a lot of freedom to define his sense of self and identity in ways which he would not have needed to before. But the freedom is plastic, because consumerism and materialism often fill that lack of identity found among deracinated individuals, and this can be seen in people who anchor their identities in being nerds or fans of specific franchises. In short, the fandom problem is a result of the destruction of the normal and traditional identities individuals enjoyed before rampant consumerism and atomization, and before the governments and institutions of Western societies decided that the traditional identities held for centuries were bad. I'd like to mention in passing that an identity built by a consumption of items from a specific IP or set of IPs is not like a healthy human relationship with give and take and reciprocal exchanges of love, support and time, but instead a one-way street. A fan will care about the products, media and decisions made by the mega corporation who owns the rights to the IP that they love, but the aforementioned mega conglomerate will never ever care about the fan. Our suggestion for the person who has built his life's identity around the consumerist habit of being a fan and wants to break free is to touch grass, take up a physical sport or discipline such as football, martial arts, weightlifting, or a hands-on craft like pottery. Basically, anything which develops the skill, or builds character and knowledge, which manifests in the real world and ideally helps you develop relationships with other individuals, is likely to provide a sense of self beyond consumption, material possession, and the accumulation of trivia knowledge. Now it's time to move on and discuss the obstacles which prevent critics on YouTube from moving on. One thing Jared and I have observed is critics on YouTube have been developing intellectually, and their critiques have become sharper. Back in 2018, I made a video essay entitled The Theory Behind Why This Is Happening, open brackets, Indiana Jones is going to be a woman, close brackets, where I argued that directors and producers in the film industry are influenced by the theories of the neo-Marxist thinker Antonio Gramsci especially his theory of hegemony, and that they were deliberately making ideological, progressive sequels, spin-offs and reboots to capture media which weren't part of their ideology in order to make them progressive, and, in the process, increase their hegemony over Western culture. Explicit in my thesis was the idea that the film industry was not motivated by money or profit and was not going to stop even if they saw financial losses or received legitimate creative criticism instead of money. At the time, this was a boldish, although not entirely new, critique, and wasn't something that many of the bigger YouTube critics were willing to accept. But now, this has largely become accepted as fact by both fandoms and Critic YouTube. In 2020, I made a video essay entitled The Problem with Critic YouTube, where I pointed out that critics on YouTube were ignoring the moral arguments which were being made by progressives in regards to issues such as diversity and representation. Progressive YouTube critics were arguing about the moral ought, while anti-progressive slash anti-woke YouTube critics were arguing about the creative ought and speaking past them. This was a widespread problem in 2020, but now it appears that anti-progressive YouTube critics are more comfortable with making moral arguments against progressive ideology in modern media. So Critic YouTube has not been static by any metric. However, YouTube critics seem incapable of moving on, despite the fact that nearly every film, every sequel, reboot, spin-off, etc. made by the film industry is destined to be awful and to be an ideologically motivated propaganda piece to boot, Critics on YouTube line up at the cinema to pay good money to see media they know will be hot garbage. Why don't YouTube critics go to the cinema to see stuff which they might actually enjoy? 
Why don't they review new independent films, or media made by creators who don't get much exposure? Critical Drinker writes his own novels, but he doesn't mention them in his reviews. Why didn't he advertise his books at the end of his videos on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny? I have seen him mention his novels on Twitter once, but never in his video reviews. I believe there are three reasons why YouTube critics seem content to attack all these bad films which are coming out rather than doing anything which I have just suggested. These reasons are catharsis, esteem, and revenue. Catharsis is easy to explain. No one likes watching something bad, or seeing a beloved series or franchise of films pulled through the mud by terrible new creations, and lining up your frustrations and presenting your criticisms can be a good way of letting off steam. Esteem is about the gratification which one receives when your video gets tens of thousands of views, thousands of likes and hundreds of comments because you have made a video criticising the latest bad film. Believe me, it does feel good. Finally, revenue. This is also easy to explain. If you do YouTubing as a profession, and you have monetization activated, Patreon and subscribe star links, and you have products on sale, then you become dependent on the wishes of your audience and have to make videos they want to watch. Not to mention the wider internet. These are all powerful incentives to remain critiquing, commenting on, and ranting about the latest woke film. But the most powerful of these obstacles to moving on for the YouTube critic is the revenue issue. Even if a YouTube critic wants to move on and talk about different media or new things, if the lion's share of his income is from his takedowns of woke media, he won't be in a position to move on without putting himself in dire financial straits. Additionally, it feels good to do something creative and make good money from it. The obvious solution to facilitate moving on for the YouTube critic would be to do internet critique part-time and get a reliable job in real life. However, this isn't realistic for some YouTube critics, and I personally do not feel comfortable advising people I haven't met on how to manage their businesses. Still, this is the only way a YouTube critic could allow themselves to move on and stop talking about the latest progressive media without risking their standard of living. One reason why I can make videos on whatever I want and whenever I want, although increasingly this has turned into whenever I can and whenever I have the passion, is because my finances are not tied to this channel. Sure, I find it disappointing when a video doesn't perform the way I would hope, but no matter what happens to my channel, my finances will not be hit. Full-time YouTube critics do not have this freedom. Now finally, a message of optimism. Normally, I'm the last person anyone should look to for hope or optimism. I tend to be measured at best and cynical at worst. However, I'm breaking with tradition to share a hopeful prediction of mine. In five years' time, I think the audiences of Critic YouTube and the critics themselves will start moving on. Why do I think this? Well, it's actually because of an observation that Critical Drinker and some of his guests shared on a live stream. They observed that Lucasfilm has burned through its catalogue of profitable IPs, now that Indiana Jones 5 has been confirmed as the disaster we all knew it would be. Under Kathleen Kennedy's management, Lucasfilm has ruined Star Wars, Willow, The Mandalorian, and now Indiana Jones. But it is not just Lucasfilm. Studios across the film industry are burning through all the famous IPs in their cupboards and losing massive amounts of goodwill and patience in the process. Eventually, fandoms and the average Joe will get fed up and start turning their attentions elsewhere for entertainment. This will incentivize YouTube critics to start reviewing independent scenes and media because it will be the only way to sustain a healthy income, and thus they will move on with their audiences. In the end, many people will move on. By the way, I have written and self-published books under a pen name. If you have enjoyed books by C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, and Philip Pullman, I can recommend my family-friendly books Earl the Dragonslayer, Escape from Labyrinth, and The Northward Journey. Escape from Labyrinth and The Northward Journey are part of a trilogy, 
and the third book is going to be released in either October this year or February next year. If you enjoy pulp fiction books by great writers such as Robert E. Howard, then you may enjoy my short story, Roger Half and the Golden Axe. Finally, if you're a fan of Terry Pratchett, then you may enjoy my novella, The Pub on the Other Side of the Forest. This story is Terry Pratchett on steroids. I have made audio previews of all these stories and uploaded them on this YouTube channel. Links are in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you all for watching. I hope you all have an excellent day.